This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We saw a spike in kids with respiratory illnesses this year, in part because after the long pandemic restrictions were lifted, kids were back in school socializing with friends more. We're seeing a spike in something else, too. Bullying. And experts say it's impacting mental health. CBC's Brittany Greenslade has more. Row after row, these students are sitting together, united, pink shirts on, taking a stand against bullying. But experts say these movements are doing little to actually move the needle on the problem. But we know that generally pretty serious bullying that's happening, you know, uh, at least around once a week. Taunting, teasing, even threatening. It's happening at school, in sports and online. Anthony Voke is an expert in the field and says during the pandemic, bullying dropped by 25 to 50 percent as kids moved to remote learning and socialized less. But now it's back to pre-pandemic levels. So bullying has come right back, unfortunately, to the levels it was before. According to Public Safety Canada, one third of teenagers have recently been bullied. That this is really harmful behavior that's really hurting the emotional well-being of our adolescents. Vogue says the number of children being bullied remains stubbornly high, barely changing over the past two decades, and it has lasting impacts. So there's long-term data now showing that bullying 10, 20, 30 years later causes changes in your stress response, your inflammatory response, your immune response. Um, so it's very harmful for victims. One Winnipeg-based therapist says she sees those impacts in her practice every day, and they last well into adulthood. And I say, what was the name of your bully? Instantly, they know the name. Decades later, they have not forgotten what that person's name was, what they looked like, how they spoke, what they said, the names that they were called. It's, it's just stored in there so clearly. Clausen says she's seeing more children who are behind in their social development since the pandemic and are struggling to navigate bullying. And so I think our kids need extra support because they've had less exposure to all the things, including things like bullying. Clausen says it's important to keep the lines of communication open and to listen to your kids and know they will get through it with your help. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. A foundation that aims to protect kids and teenagers from being trafficked says educating those around them is crucial. That's why the Joy Smith Foundation launched its See the Trafficking Signs program today with billboards, a social media campaign and website. I started dressing the way he liked. He bought me a second phone. My grades started to drop. He invited me to bars and clubs. That's just part of a video released today to help parents, caregivers, and targets of sex trafficking rem recognize the signs of grooming. Joy Smith says young people in all areas of the province are vulnerable to this. Every race, every gender, every income level. She says social media has made it easier for predators and traffickers to find children to exploit. Smith hopes the awareness campaign will open people's eyes to red flags. If they have two cell phones, watch, something's happening because traffickers always give them an extra cell phone to keep track of them. If a kid who can't afford it comes in with new clothing, particularly de designer clothing, and I don't know why, but gold chains is one of them that they love to give their, their targets. Smith says another sure sign is if a child changes their group of friends. If you suspect someone is being exploited or you are a survivor yourself, contact police. There are other resources available to help. Visit the website traffickingsigns.ca. A 31-year-old Winnipeg woman has been charged after a lengthy police investigation into online ads for massage services. Investigators say a number of victims in their 20s were recruited to provide sexual services through these ads. Victims were promised a portion of the money, but police say they got only a fraction 
of what was paid. The woman is charged with multiple offenses around providing and receiving material benefit from sexual services as well as possession of cocaine. Now, you're, you're familiar with Amber Alerts, the emergency notification sent by police when a child is abducted. Their life could be in danger. A Winnipeg MP wants that same level of urgency applied when an Indigenous woman goes missing. CBC's Cameron McLean reports on a push to create what advocates call a red dress alert. That's the sound of an Amber Alert. Winnipeg MP Leah Gazan wants the federal government to set up a similar emergency phone notification system for missing Indigenous women and girls. Every moment we wait, another woman goes missing or murdered. That's why we're calling for a red dress alert. So that should, in any event, unfortunate event, a loved one goes missing, that it, it gets immediate attention. The National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls found that Indigenous women disappear at a disproportionate rate. Families searching for loved ones often have to rely on community groups and social media to get the word out. By the time those systems kick into action, it's often too late. Advocates like Sandra Delarond hope a red dress alert will increase the chances of Indigenous women and girls being found alive. People might get annoyed. However, it will, I think, bring to bear on Canada the real critical, uh, the real critical safety uh, issues for Indigenous women and girls. Gazan wrote a letter to Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino urging him to set up the program. CBC requested comment from Mendicino but did not immediately receive a response. Details of how the system would work still need to be worked out. Right now, it's an idea. It's, a, it's an idea that uh, families and advocates uh, around the country have put forward. I'm heeding that call and calling on the federal government to respond uh, with action. Action which families and advocates hope will lead to better outcomes when Indigenous women go missing. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. A Winnipeg man says he wants accountability after his partner went five weeks without palliative home care. We first brought you this story last week. Eric DeShepper spoke out to CBC after his partner Catherine Ellis went weeks without a home care visit. She was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in November. She died on Saturday. The home care she was supposed to get didn't arrive until three days after she died. DeShepper has now filed a complaint with the Manitoba Ombudsman. He says he wants to help change things for other people. In a statement, an official with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority says this situation highlights the need to do better and that the WRHA will be reviewing the circumstances to prevent similar situations from happening in the future. Meantime, the province says it has been increasing funding to home care and will add another $1.3 million in the next fiscal year as part of its new seniors strategy. Seniors and long-term care minister Scott Johnston says that will make almost $14 million more the province is spending on self and family managed care programs since the beginning of the current fiscal year. The goal is to allow seniors to live quality lives in their own homes. Johnston says the funding will increase payments to the 1,200 clients already in the program and help extend the program to help more Manitobans. It supports clients in taking full responsibility for arranging, coordinating and managing those non-professional services required to meet their assessed home care needs. Johnson says this funding is just one of several senior strategies his government will announce in the next several weeks. It's been almost 16 months since Heather Stephenson won the Manitoba PC leadership race, but her close battle with Shelley Glover has left the party with a financial hangover. CBC's Bartley Kivas joins us now from the newsroom to walk us through this. That leadership race, Bartley, was October 2021. Why is this still affecting the party's finances? 
Janet, that Manitoba PCs ended 2021 with a deficit, a little more than $400,000. According to the party's financial statements, most of that deficit was due to legal and auditing fees. Now, of course, Heather Stephenson won that leadership race. She beat Shelley Glover by 363 votes and became premier days later. Glover took the party to court to challenge the result and lost. In the following year, the party raised about $300,000. The constituency associations raised that money. Last week, Heather Stephenson revealed that money won't be used to fight the provincial election this year. It's going back to the party. Stephenson told a meeting of the PC Tuxedo Constituency Association the money was used to pay off the legal bills. Now, what you're about to hear is audio provided by a PC member who attended that meeting on February 16th. You'll recall we were um, unfortunately in a, a lawsuit which continues and that that uh, is unfortunate but it's a situation that we're in as a party. So the donations made to the PCs in 2022 went to pay for the leadership race the year before. What does that mean for this election year? Well, Stephenson said at that tuxedo meeting that the party has to raise more money. Party spokesperson Michelle Halverson said in a statement that that fundraising is already underway. Now, the provincial election is slated for October 3rd. Political scientist Royce Coop says he doesn't believe the PCs will have any problem filling that hole. I think this is probably something that the Tories can make up. I think these, these sorts of losses, I think they're going to be spending uh, the amount that they would spend in any case. They're going to be able to fundraise as the election gets closer. Now, I spoke to several PC donors, and most said they had no concerns about how their money was being used. But one who is based in Beauxjour told me he would have preferred the cash be used to support election candidates. What about the more recent case, Bartley, where the Liberal leader has taken Stephenson to court? Who's going to pay those legal bills? Well, that's the civil action where Liberal leader Dougal Lamont wants a court to determine whether Heather Stephenson violated conflict of interest rules. Lamont says he's paying his own legal bills. Stephenson says she's doing the same. The NDP, meanwhile, says it's happy not to get involved. Janet. Thank you so much. That's CBC's Bartley Kivas reporting from the newsroom. Shannon Martin is the latest PC MLA to bow out of the next provincial election. The McPhillips MLA has announced he will not run for re-election. Roughly a third of the PC caucus has either resigned or announced they will not run again. McPhillips is one of the Winnipeg ridings important for the progressive conservatives to retain if they are to be re-elected later this year. The federal government is investing $6.7 million in a downtown Winnipeg Indigenous organization. Ghani Ganichuk is now able to expand its downtown campus on McDermott Avenue. The funding also means the organization can create new programs that help children, youth, women, men and families heal, succeed and become leaders. Dan Vandal, Minister of Prairie's Economic Development, says the expansion will help the organization serve more people. This additional space will allow Gani Gani Chuck to continue building on programs so that thousands more people can take advantage of these services and these programs and these supports in downtown Winnipeg. It's important to me because Vandell says the expansion will help fund a new space for ceremonies. It will expand the current child care centre and fund a new outdoor gathering space. He says the organization currently serves more than 3,000 Indigenous people. Well, here in Manitoba, the tradition of the outdoor rink is alive and well. The same is true in other provinces where they can count on a cold winter. Cameron McIntosh hit the ice recently with a local filmmaker who's traveling the country to capture that magic. Just a camera and his skates. For filmmaker Randy Frickus, these are the moments. The sounds are so vivid, the sights, you know, you got the sun going down. Now Daryl's got the lights on, like, it's, it's, it's magical. Hockey, at its most basic. Outdoors, open, spontaneous. What are the pictures saying to you right now? Well, right now, it's like, the pictures are, are directing me. This is the ideal scenario for, for storytelling and, and for just capturing what this is. Capturing the outdoor game on rinks across the country for his outdoor hockey club documentary series, on what still drives people outside. We're called the Goon Girls. Like Ashley Denisoff, <laughs> who taught herself to skate in the pandemic. Now, she plays a weekly pickup game in Whitehorse. It is supportive and welcoming and fun. Or in Mooseman, Saskatchewan, a chance encounter with Jesse McMullen 
and his six-year-old daughter, Hadley. And we love skating for fun because you aren't skating to win. And when you have fun, that's all that matters. That's the essence of hockey, a, a, a father and a daughter just passing the puck around, skating laps, no real agenda. Community to community, rink to rink, access is a common theme. Between the three of us, we all get out here quite often. Here near McGregor, Manitoba, Daryl Weeb put together a rink and warming shack, mostly with stuff on hand on his farm. For his family, neighbours and anyone else that might not be able to get all the way to town. So I just wanted something um, available for that kind of stuff and for the community to have something close by instead of having to maybe pay ice times or stuff like that. Against a prairie sunset, game on. 99% no, of it is showing up, so once you're there, uh, and the stories unfold, the people are comfortable because we're talking hockey, we're enjoying the game. Just a stick, a puck, and a clear shot. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, near McGregor, Manitoba. Meteorologist John Sauter joins us now. How much does that remind you of your childhood? Yeah, I loved watching that story. You know, I used to go to the rink and pick up a game. People you don't know, you're there for hours just sure. having a great time. And still, at this stage in my life, I'm still playing hockey. We'll play tonight, you know, not right. outside, though. No. Not outside. No. Lucky. Yeah. A little too cold for that. Stream cold warning still in effect. Let's get to the warnings right now because southern Manitoba is now in the warning. The north has been dropped, and that's simply because it's just not quite as cold as yesterday, not quite meeting the criteria. But this is a massive uh, amount of cold air here across the country. All of Saskatchewan, Alberta, parts of B.C., a good chunk of northern Ontario, and well off into Quebec as well. So this extreme cold warning is pretty widespread, and we've got lots of other weather to the south of the border that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Right now, minus 23. We did get slightly above that today. The wind chill value puts us in that frostbite range probably in about uh, uh, less than 30 minutes, certainly, but uh, probably around 20 minutes on exposed skin. So out walking the dog, and you really need to cover up tonight. Last year similar temperatures minus 22.4 and in the morning last year on this date February 22nd minus 34.1 so not uncommon and what we're seeing right now is a little bit of cloud moving into the southern part of the province and that means no minus 30s tonight at least across the south they think we'll have temperatures in the mid minus 20s and this cloud is just on the northern periphery of a massive snowy rainy icy system to the south of us so yeah certainly some weather we're dodging today and tomorrow um, what we will see is the cloud kind of sticking around in through the day on thursday there's eight in the morning notice the north winds they're going to get gustier tonight and stay kind of strong kind of on the breezy side through the day tomorrow and then they do relax a little bit on friday we get brighter on friday morning winds are shifting now to the south a little bit more cloud around friday afternoon a few flurries are possible on friday night but no big accumulation there so tonight with the cloud cover minus 26 but with a north wind at 20 to 40 that puts us in that that extreme cold warning range and that's kind of the same for tomorrow morning pretty brisk at the bus stop early in the day in the afternoon we still only get to minus 21 normal high minus six and the winds start to relax just a little bit and then there's a bit of clearing as we head into friday still cold friday a lot less in the way of wind still cold as we head into saturday at minus 17 for a high notice the morning temperatures still down there a ways and then a bit of a break by sunday afternoon we are at minus seven i think it's a good time to uh get the skis out and get outside on sunday thanks john you bet now we do have some breaking news we want to bring you now. Uh, but we'll bring that to you in just a moment. We've got some video that we're waiting for. First of all, some good news for CBC. Nominees for the 2023 Canadian Screen Awards were announced this morning. Two members of the CBC Manitoba team are on that list, including the I-team's Caroline Bargoot. She's nominated in the Best Local Reporter category. Our executive producer, Jillian Taylor, worked on Kidnapped by a Nun, a residential school survivor story, which is nominated for Best News or Information segment. CBC Radio Canada has 320 nominations this year, with 22 of those in news, current affairs and local. The winners will be announced in April. 
Still to come, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with China's top diplomat today. What was said about their strategic cooperation and the war in Ukraine after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. Your stories, your community. CBC's Communities in Focus is coming to Steinbeck starting February 21st. Visit cbc.ca slash Manitoba slash community for more. Okay, now we can show you the breaking news happening in Winnipeg right now. Take a look at this video just in. It's from the 700 block of Dufferin Avenue in the north end of Winnipeg. Look at all that smoke. We don't have a lot of details in just yet, but you can see there's a big presence of firefighters and police on scene. Firefighters have been battling a fire here since around 5 o'clock this afternoon. Police have been at this home. They've closed off streets in and around the area. Closed them at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. We could see on the scene officers with shields going toward the fire and there was a person on the porch of the home where the fire is. Now, we don't have many details except what we've told you. We'll bring you more as it comes in. Remember, cbc.ca slash Manitoba for the very latest. 
Russian President Vladimir Putin held a meeting with China's top diplomat today. Moscow's denying there was any discussion of a Chinese peace plan to help end the war in Ukraine. Briar Stewart reports. <laughs> when Russia's president met China's top diplomat, there were overtures about a rock-solid, unshakable bond. No, we're reaching new frontiers, proclaimed Vladimir Putin. No, Wang Yi described the friendship as immune from outside influence. No, we will not be overwhelmed by coercion and pressure from third parties, he said. But the Ukraine war has changed the dynamic. Russia needs China and its markets more than ever before. This week, both countries are taking part in military drills off the coast of South Africa. China has said it's neutral when it comes to Ukraine. But analysts say it's clear Xi Jinping doesn't want to see Putin fail. It's just that China's support isn't absolute. China and Russia under Xi Jinping is still a strategic partnership. The rhetoric of an unlimited friendship is over the top. There are clear limits to what the Chinese will do for the Russians. He says China wants to avoid being the target of secondary sanctions that could be triggered if the country decides to help Russia on the battlefield. A growing concern on our part uh, that China is considering providing lethal support to Russia in its aggression against Ukraine. China dismissed those concerns. One year on, Russia isn't acknowledging its defeats. In fact, quite the opposite. It's celebrating. Putin! This patriotic concert was held to mark Russia's Defender of the Fatherland Day. The president led the crowd in a group cheer. There are reports some left even before he spoke, but cameras captured only enthusiasm. I came to support the political course of our president and our country, says this man. Putin says that China's president will visit Moscow in the coming months. It's expected that Xi Jinping will be making a speech on Friday appealing for peace. But officials with Russia's foreign ministry say there was no talk of any peace plan in the meetings. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. As the war in Ukraine approaches its first anniversary this coming Friday, its government keeps up the call for more and better weapons. Near the top of that list, fighter jets. Ukraine's Western allies are not committing to warplanes, in part because of the lengthy training required. But the country does have a fledgling air force, and CBC's Margaret Evans spoke with one of its most successful pilots. One of Ukraine's kings of the sky. It's an elite club, and Vadim Voroshilov has earned the right to show off a little. He's flown 77 missions since the start of the Russian invasion. He spoke to us from a confidential location. When we are on duty in those operational airfields, we are sitting in our full equipment. Five minutes after a task is assigned, we are in the plane, and in ten, we are in the air. Last fall, Voroshilov steered his burning plane away from a city before ejecting, filming his descent in his parachute. In December, he was awarded the Order of the Gold Star. His wish that Western partners agree to help Ukraine upgrade its fleet. Russian aircraft have rockets with a range of about 75 kilometers. Unfortunately, our rockets have a much shorter range, so we just can't compete with them in the air. The city of Vinitsa is home to the Ukrainian Air Force headquarters, a monument to its presence somehow still standing, even though three Russian cruise missiles hit just near it last July. 28 people were killed and the theater beside it destroyed. Destroyed. Colonel Yuri Irnat is the spokesperson for the Air Force Command. He says Ukraine's youngest plane dates back to 1991. And the pilots who perform tasks on these planes every day risk their lives, he says. And they know it, and the command knows it. And so the ask for Western fighter jets, F-16s in particular, is asked again. But the response remains mixed. Some NATO countries worry it would draw the military alliance closer to direct confrontation with Russia. 
Others point to logistical impediments, like the time it would take to train pilots. Poroshilov's response isn't surprising. Bring it on. Ukraine's fighter pilots are fast learners. As for Western fighter jets, I believe and always say that this will be our weapon of victory. It would speed its arrival, he says, and save many lives. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Ukraine. Palestinian sources say 10 people were killed and more than 100 injured during a daytime raid by Israeli troops in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. <laughs> The group Islamic Jihad said two of its commanders had been encircled in a house in Nablus. Israel says its troops came under fire while trying to detain those militants who, Israel says, were planning attacks. The army says there were no Israeli casualties. Palestinians say three civilians are among the dead, including a 72-year-old man. Hamas says one of its fighters was also killed. Still ahead on our program tonight, more on the impact of that massive snowstorm causing chaos south of the border. And a story all of us should know about the history of Winnipeg. Black History Month after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
February is Black History Month, a time to reflect and learn the stories that have shaped our communities. Judy Williams is a well-known Winnipegger. She's a social worker who organizes Jerry Fest, an art celebration in memory of her late brother, musician Jerry Atwell. But she and her brother are not the first members of their family to play prominent roles in our community. CBC's Emily Brass met with Williams to learn how several generations of her family made important contributions to Winnipeg. So 298 Charles Street was one of the boarding homes that our family purchased when they came to Canada from the USA. Judy Williams' family moved to Winnipeg in 1905. They knew there were jobs at Eaton's, they heard, and the new catalog sales was being built. They knew there were jobs on the railroad, and so they thought they settled in Winnipeg. They did have some money. The family opened two boarding homes in the North End, and they offered black people a place to stay in Winnipeg at a time when they weren't allowed at hotels. Many of the boarders were railway porters, like her grandfather, Ernest Brown. He was an exalted leader of the Elks and had ties to one of Canada's first unions. Very often, you see them parading, like kind of like you would see the Strongest Parade. They had the fez. They had the, they had the yeah, the purple, a purple fez, yes. He was known as being, to be a, a really good cook, and he'd cook up a storm for the boarders who lived here as well. These are some of the albums that my, my mother carefully put together. Photos from William's family albums are on display at the Manitoba Museum for Black History Month. Many of them were taken by her grandmother, Beatrice Brown. The railway porters, band picnic. The pictures give us a view of Winnipeg's early black history, something Williams wishes was more widely known. We've been here for a long time, and so when you ask us where we're born, it can be offensive. It's because a lot of us were born, born here. And not only from here, yeah. but key to building the mm -hmm. Winnipeg of today. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you're here right by my side. Williams is well known for organizing Jerry Fest in honor of her late brother, Jerry Atwell. But her family's been a big part of the community for well over a century. They have some money that, was, that had come through the family in the form of diamonds. And kind of a bittersweet story. My great, great, great grandmother was an enslaved woman and her name was known to us as Black Beauty. Her enslaver loved her and um, he freed her, two, her three children a couple of years before emancipation and gave them some diamonds and they went off on their own 12, at 12, 13 and 14 to the northern states. They worked in servitude positions until they made it to Canada. Those diamonds bought the family's boarding homes in Winnipeg. That's where William's mother grew up and made her own mark on history. She went to University of Manitoba and, and graduated with a degree in pharmacy in 1948. 29 male students, five women were in her class and she's known as the first black person to graduate from the University of Manitoba in, in pharmacy. Her mom met Judy's dad, George Atwell, at the boarding house. He came to um, Canada from Trinidad. He was told to stay at the Browns boarding house. They were a good family. My mom always describes it as someone tall, dark, and handsome showing up at the door of her place. A lot of black students stayed with the Browns since university residences were white only. It must not have been easy. I bet there were some challenges. I'm sure, I mean, I know there would have been challenges for my mother. When it came time for her apprenticeship, she couldn't find one. But my, my grandmother, her mother, Beatrice, because she had a connection with the church, and she was able to get a place for my mother at the St. Basil Hospital. So that worked out really well. The same kind of thing happened to my father when it came to his work practicum when he was finishing education. He ended up finding a, a position in a small little town that doesn't even exist anymore called Reedy Creek. Um, he ended up at one room schoolhouse he taught at. He loved it. It was his favorite job of all times. Her father was also a lieutenant commander at HCMS Chippewa, one of its highest ranking black reservists. And that difficulty of finding an apprenticeship or a practicum, yes. is that because of the race barrier? Of, because oh, they definitely, were black? definitely it was. It was at the time. Seeing my parents in the role of teacher, in the role of pharmacy, cyst, it was life changing for some people. Like seeing the pharmacist that serves you at the counter that talks, that, you know, asks you questions about yourself and then, you know, fills your prescription. Um, and then also having a teacher that you can identify with, for sure, it's very important. Thanks so much for sharing You're your welcome. story, Judy. You're welcome, my pleasure. As John mentioned, a massive snowstorm is causing chaos south of the border. 
Knee deep snow and winds approaching 100 kilometers an hour have paralyzed parts of the U.S. Most affected are the north and midwestern regions, but nearly 30 states and 50 million Americans are bracing for some kind of impact. Highways are closed, power is down in many places, many schools and businesses shuttered. Hundreds of flights have been canceled. Among the hardest hit cities is Minneapolis, where emergency crews are on standby. John, as you know, has been tracking this. What a big storm. It's huge. It uh, is, has affected California and, and will eventually move right up into the northeast. Even some snow on the Las Vegas Strip today. I saw some video online. It was pretty amazing. Have a look at this. This is the upper trough that is actually our friend. Now, I know it's bringing the cold weather, but see the position of the jet stream? That has a lot to do with how all of this weather is tracking. Let's just uh, go over to this and show you the satellite and radar. This is all snow on the cold side of the system. Down here in Chicago, we've got massive amounts of rain, and right in, in the middle of all that is ice, and that's what's moving up into southern Ontario tonight. So even in Canada, our hub airport, Pearson, will be affected in the coming days by ice, snow, and even some rain, and Minneapolis really being hit. Janet mentioned this. Uh, Minneapolis, the rest of Minnesota, could be measuring snow by tomorrow in feet a couple of feet. That's 60 centimeters. Wisconsin being hit very, very hard as well. We are on the north end of this and we'll see some cloud cover moving in tonight. So you look at the current temperatures and they really haven't moved too much today. Tonight they won't move much more because that cloud is going to act like a blanket over us. So you no know, minus 30s tonight, but temperatures will be down in the mid minus 20s. These are the current numbers. Still cold in Barron's River at minus 29, minus 28 in Churchill, minus 22 to minus 23 in the west and minus 26 right now in Island Lake. For Forecast conditions starting in northwestern Ontario tonight. We're looking at mid minus 20s and the cloud, yes, will thicken up. So most of this is going to be cloudy skies with temperatures that are in the mid minus 20s. Although Barron's River getting down to minus 34 tonight. And we look at the southwest, minus 28 in Brandon, minus 31 in Swan River. Frostbite in just minutes. This is where we have the warning. So we're talking 10 minutes or less on exposed skin. And still some mid minus 30s to the north, uh, namely Norway House out to Flin Flon, the Paw, down to minus 33. But daytime highs tomorrow with generally dry conditions and sunny to partly cloudy conditions are in the low to mid minus 20s. And much the same here in the south. Uh, winds will be factoring into this with temps in the minus 19 to minus 21 range and a wind gusting to 40 kilometers per hour. That puts us in the criteria for an extreme cold warning. You look at northwestern Ontario, cloudy as well, minus 17 to minus 19 for daytime highs tomorrow. Well, tomorrow is National Aviation Day, so I don't know if you've noticed, but my <laughs> friend John has a little extra bounce in his step. Yeah, I kind of do. And today I thought I'd head over to the Royal Aviation Museum over at the airport and find out what kind of events they have planned for tomorrow. Brent Phillips is with the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. Thanks for having us here today. And, and tomorrow is National Aviation Day. You've got some special things planned for the day, don't you? That's right. It's our first year open. So it's our first uh, time celebrating National Aviation Day, which celebrates uh, the first powered flight in Canada, which was in 1909. So we have a bunch of programming planned for the day, uh, some special tours, uh, and uh, photography night in the evening. Yeah, tell me about the tours. There, there are a couple of guys that are going to do some tours, and there's a lot of history there. It might take a little while, right? <laughs> it, it might take a little while. Uh, so normally we have tours at 145, which is a shorter 30-minute tour, but tomorrow we're doing some special longer tours with a couple of our volunteers, uh, just, uh, go, going over some of our aircraft and 100 years of aviation history in Canada. It's been a big, this first year has been a pretty big success. It's been busy here at the museum. It has. So we 
opened last uh, year on May long weekend, and we've had over 70,000 visitors through our doors since since opening. And that's that's a good number, right? That's a great number. We're we're amazed at how successful it's been. It's, it met all of our expectations. And, and and can you talk a little bit more about the uh, photography night that's going on on Thursday evening? Sure. So it's our first time doing an after hours event for the public. So uh, it's we're inviting people to come down, take photos of the aircraft. If you've been to the museum before, it's going to look a bit different. We're lighting it and doing special lighting on some of our aircraft. Uh, so photographers and aviation lovers are invited down to take some photos and we're doing a contest. So uh, we're going to select a winner from the photos that evening yeah. once they're submitted. Uh, they're going to win a $100 gift card to our Landing Zone Boutique gift shop and an annual pass to the museum so they can come back and enjoy it all year round. As a pilot myself, when I come through here, my camera is very, very busy. <laughs> it sure yeah. is. Um, this weekend, also, Saturday and Sunday, you're going to open up some airplanes a little bit more. Yeah. Yes, it's our first time doing open cockpit days. Wow. Uh, so we are going to have two of our aircraft open to the public, uh, the Viscount and the Electra, which are just over my shoulder there. Normally you can go through the Viscount and explore the, the aircraft, but on the weekend you can sit in the cockpit seat. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, the Viscount, it, is it open like right now? Like could we, could I go in Absolutely there? Absolutely is. Really? You're more than welcome to take a tour through. I can go in there now. Okay. Right now? All right, see you later. John. Right, now we are in the Vickers Viscount. Tell me a little bit more about this airplane. Well, this airplane is one of our signature aircraft at the museum, really popular. Uh, it's originally part of the TCA flight, later became Air Canada, flew in the 50s and 60s. So this is what commercial flying used to look like. You know what, I can't believe the leg room <laughs> in here. Yeah, it's a lot different than if you're flying today. You mentioned open cockpit days. Um, that's this weekend, right? This weekend, yeah. 10 to 5, Saturday and Sunday, so visitors will have the opportunity to come inside this aircraft. Normally, you can sit in the seats like we are now. Um, on the weekend, you can sit inside the cockpit seat, see what it's like to be a pilot, take some photos, and uh, have a different experience. I'm a pilot. That's right, you are. Yeah, do I have to wait till the weekend? I think we could arrange to get you inside Really? Today. Absolutely. Like right now? Right now, let's go. Here we go. If you'd like an up-close look at the cockpit here in the Vickers Viscount, check out Open Cockpit Days here at the Royal Aviation Museum on Saturday and Sunday. John Sauter, CBC News, Winnipeg. It's like John in his happy place. Still to come, three young Winnipeggers contemplate what it means to be Filipino. Hear them open up about the pressure they feel to understand their culture and, and how they do hold on to that. The story when we return.
So what does this actually mean to be Filipino? Does that mean you speak a certain language, eat traditional food, wear certain clothes? For three young Winnipeggers, those answers are complex, definitely not one size fits all. It's made more complicated as a young person straddling the Filipino and Canadian sides of their identities. The CBC's Creator Network, along with students from Sisler High School's CREATE program, bring us this story. Being Filipino, to me, it's like, I find that I have more extroverted assets because of my culture. Being Filipino just means being part of the culture, being part of the people. <laughs> Mark Mariano. My name is Carmen Acuna. My name is Gina Villasarans. I, I was born in Quezon City in a hospital, but I was raised in uh, Malabon. Uh, I was born in Winnipeg. So I was born in Singapore. My parents are from the Philippines. Uh, right here in Winnipeg, because this is where all of our family and friends are, and uh, I've heard that Winnipeg's like a hub of like Filipinos and stuff. I moved to Canada because my parents wanted me to have a better life. Singapore was very heavily academic, and I struggled quite a lot when I was younger there. told that I don't look very Filipino at all. It's because of my um, skin complexity. I'm very fair, so a lot of people misidentify me instead of, you know, being Filipino. Growing up, I'd always be told I just don't look Filipino, that I don't look like my culture. People would just, like, assume that I'm whitewashed or assume that I'm trying to reject my culture. And I find it weird being ridiculed and being misunderstood because of appearance and because people have expected ideas of what Filipino women should look like. I'm definitely both, both Filipino and Canadian. I've been always engaging in what I can, when I can, with aspects of my culture, going to like Filipino market events and things like that. I don't really see myself as a Canadian Canadian. I've been in the Philippines for like longer than Canada and like my whole culture, my identity and all that. Of course, I'm gonna lean more towards the Filipino side. I don't think I would want to, you know, because I still want to learn a little bit more about my said past, I would say, because, you know, I was not born in the Philippines, so I want to know what it would be like if I was, you know, fully Filipino. When I grow up, I really want to integrate more of my culture. I want to embrace it even harder. Of course, it's how I am, it's who I am, it's how I look. It's such a big part of me. I can never leave it. I mean, I don't know if there's any more that I like, like want to learn more about my culture. Like, I kind of think I have a very good grasp of like what, what my culture is. You know, talking to my parents especially, you know, asking them to tell me stories from their time. You know, my dad explored the Philippines quite often. My mom becoming a nurse there. I'd love to learn more about the history behind my culture. That story from the students at Sisler's CREATE program. Still ahead, John's seven day forecast and your daily lift. We'll be right back.
So these next three days are a little on the chilly side. Tomorrow will be in that extreme cold warning still. Uh, a little bit less in the way of wind Friday and Saturday. Then a warm-up. Sunday looks like a, a pretty nice day. Minus 7, mainly sunny. few flurries and minus 5 on Monday, but minus single digits as we uh, head on into next week, which after this week is, is pretty welcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. I grew up with a dog in my family, and often our love of animals can be very uplifting. Absolutely, and it's so hard to say goodbye to them. Yeah. Crowds of people gathered to wave goodbye to a celebrity at the Tokyo Zoo earlier this day. Here is your Daily Lift. <laughs> Did I mention it was a crowd? How about 60,000 people? They all tried to attend the goodbye panda party to this giant panda. Shang Shang has been a star at the Tokyo Zoo since she was born in 2017, but she's headed back to China. Like the rest of her species, she's kind of solitary, prefers to be alone, doesn't really like the company of other pandas or 60,000 fans. So that's one of the reasons giant pandas are so hard to breed, which is the goal. Go back to China. Try to breed pandas, more giant pandas. Beautiful animal. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.